All right, good morning. Uh, well, today I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, the idea I had was about calling in the future because this, in fact, is what we are doing all the time. Let me make sure I'm, yeah, okay, I'm here. Uh, that, uh, you know, in the science of mind, we, we say uh, what's always manifesting is our intention. And so I think it's important that we individually have an intention for our future, not just our personal future, but the future of our family, our community, the world that we live in. Uh, because knowing what we know about history, I think we can recognize that we are going through uh, a very unique time right now. Uh, also, that uh, if we look, it seems like things are really speeding up. They say the technology doubles every 18 months. Isn't that extraordinary to think about what we have technologically right now will be double that in about a year and a half. Wow, I just think that's, that's amazing. So I could just say, all right, well, I'm just going to sit back and let happen whatever it is that's going to happen. You know, I could, which, in, which is another way of saying, well, I'm just going to be at effect. I'm just going to be at effect of all of this, uh, what, whatever it is. Or I could have a very clear intention, because what's always manifesting is our intention, for my intention would be for a greater expression of truth, a greater expression of God's will in my life, uh, an intention for healing, an intention for a peaceful world to live in. See, because the thing that I think we forget when we sit back and we watch the news and read the paper and stuff like that is that we are involved in creating it, you know, just as much as anyone else is, that we all have um, a say because our mind is connected with all minds everywhere. So what we're thinking about our world, what we're saying about our world, what we're anticipating in our mind about our world is actually what's creating what's next for all of us. So if we want something of a higher order, what that means is that on the inside, we have to start to model something of a higher order. You know, I know everybody I know has been through all kinds of things that change us uh, in a deep way. You know, I was, I was thinking about this, you know, because we had a big anniversary for Woodstock recently, you know. That was one of those events that seemed to change a lot of people. But I think about many things in my own lifetime. You know, uh, you know, the assassination of JFK and Martin Luther King Jr. when we landed on the moon. It might be somebody you met. And because of that person you met, your life moved in a different way or took a different direction. I think it's um, an auspicious time. 2019, we are still in the first 25 years of not just a new century, but a new millennium, you know? And so I think, well, we actually have a role in creating how this next thousand years plays out, all right? Um, because, the, you know, there, there are these, if we just look, there are, there are cycles, you know? And we could say, okay, this is, we're starting a whole new cycle on the face of the earth now. So in A Course in Miracles, it talks about how ideas are strengthened when they're shared. And I like that, you know, I, I, because th that means, you know, ideas get to grow when we share an idea, particularly a good idea, a healing idea, a loving idea, an idea that really, really serves. So I think we have to articulate how we want it to be. See, personally, I think, okay, I want the world to be a better place because I was here, not worse because I was here. I want people to feel uplifted because I was in their life, not damaged because I was in their life. On and on and on, right? And we get to fill in those blanks for ourselves about whatever it is we do, whoever we're spending our time with, how we want that to be. It's not like it just happens and, oh, that was a bad day. We have input into it. We are creating it by contributing our thought and the energy of our heart and mind. I include those both together in this case. You know, uh, the idea of an enemy, I think, has to go or, or we're not going to survive for very long. You know, uh, because, you know, the truth is, so, so let me say this through the lens of science of mind. There is no enemy out there, right, that we have to look within, we have to sit in the seat of our own consciousness and ask ourselves the really hard questions. You know, so when I see something out in the world that's not loving, what I have to do is say, oh, okay, I'm noticing not loving because not loving must be in me. This is right out of our textbook. Ernest Holmes says in the Science of Mind textbook, if one detects, and he's so polite, he's so kind, he says, if one detects unloveliness in another person, perhaps it is because unloveliness is a strong component in oneself. 
In other words, if you think other people are being a bitch, it's because you're a bitch. That's what he's saying. Right? So I have to sit in the seat of my own consciousness and say, where am I not loving? Where am I not forgiving? Where am I not grateful? Where am I being uh, greedy? Where am I uh, creating separation? Where am I thinking about me rather than thinking about we? See, our needs are not separate from each other because in the science of mind, at the highest level, at the, at the macrocosm level of our teaching, we teach that we are all connected. It looks like you're over there and I'm over here, but science of mind says every person, every soul is connected on the unseen side of life. So if we're connected, I would not intend anything for you that isn't for your highest and greatest good, your most loving expression of the life abundant. Why would I want something for you that's not good? Because if we're connected, that's like telling the universe, I want something for me that's not good. So, you know, our needs are not really separate from each other, you know? And I think what's really, really so, and as the world seems to get smaller and smaller, we really notice that what we do affects each other. Um, so it's like John Donne wrote years ago. He said, no man is an island. And now if we've had that kind of island thinking, I think the time is quickly evaporating when we can hold on to that. Because the truth is, if someone else suffers, ultimately it will affect us. We will suffer. We're all connected. You know, the world is much smaller than it used to be and looks like it's just going to continue in that way. So, you know, the way I see things work is that I think that ideas cook in consciousness for a long time, inside of us for a long time before they actually manifest out here. So if we say, okay, what's in the world today? What's in the world today is what was cooking in consciousness for a while before it actually showed up in the world today. And so we could say this is uh, my home life or my job or my country or, or uh, with anything because ideas cook in consciousness before they show up out here. You know, and when there's enough agreement and enough faith and enough belief, boom, that's when it bursts forth into the human uh, scene of experience. So I wonder today what we are really ready for. You know, what will we consider differently? Because I think we say, well, you know, I want there to be a loving world. I want there to be a peaceful world. I want all people to have their needs met, on and on and on. Um, but what are we really ready for? See, um, I, I was thinking about this this week for some reason. I was thinking about books that I read, you know, great literature I read when I was in college. And in some sense, that's a great thing, to be exposed to great works of literature and art when you're very, very young. But you know, if you go back years later and look at those great works, they mean something completely different. Because really, who at 18 years old is ready to understand Ibsen and Chekhov and, you know, uh, Strindberg and uh, great philosophers and stuff like that. Well, maybe we have some level of understanding, but the thing is, you know, at 18 years old, we haven't lived a lot of life yet, you know? So then speed, speed, and I do mean speed down the road a number of decades, <laughs> and we look at that same material and go, wow, this stuff is really deep. I really understand this stuff now. Why? Because we have lived life. We have had experiences. So we really know what the authors are, are, are speaking about, or we really understand what's being um, articulated in uh, great paintings and things like that. So I think our needs from each other are really, uh, we're really not that separate, you know? And what we do has an enormous impact on each other, you know? Because we are, we're all connected. You know, um, let's see, let's see here. Um, one of my um, favorite lines from, remember the old Mary Tyler Moore show? <laughs> one of my favorite lines is uh, the, Mary and uh, Lou Grant are having a discussion, and Mary says, oh, I've been around, and Lou Grant looks at her and says, what? And she says, oh. Okay, can remember Mary Richards, right? She's like so good. She goes, oh, all right, I've been nearby. <laughs> which, which I don't know why, that just always really made me laugh. You know, the, but see, for all of us, we have all lived life. We all have experiences. We've all been around. Okay, maybe some of us have just been nearby. But we have the potential to, to be around. Um, we do a huge disservice not, um, I think, you know, um, I recently had to be involved in um, helping my mother go into uh, a caring situation, assisted living. 
And, um, and that was an extraordinarily difficult thing. I'm still churning about it on the inside, uh, even though I pray and meditate about it every day. Um, I think we do a huge disservice not honoring um, both ends of the spectrum, our elders and our children. You know, because Science of Mind says, you know, the events that are outside of us originate with the thoughts entertained within, within us, right? So what we're experiencing out here is the byproduct of what's going on in here. You know, so if we have that kind of internal conversation that, oh, life is great when you're young, but otherwise it's not so great, you know, um, well, that's, that's going to be a really disappointing thing. And I think that life is great at every stage. There are great things about life every, every year, every chapter, at every level. You know, sometimes one of the things I notice about this is that, you know, when I'm getting ready to really let go of something, sometimes before there's a big let go, I think, okay, this idea doesn't serve me anymore. This way of being, this way of being, it doesn't serve me anymore. I'm really, really let it, ready to let that go. I notice that I'll often have one last hurrah with it. Do you know what I mean? I have, I have to like, you know, get on that sinking ship one last time just to really remind myself, yes, this ship is going down. No good's going to come from this. I'd better swim to the surface very quickly. I mean, I've certainly done it. It's like when you say, I'm going to be loving today no matter what. I'm going to be loving today no matter what. You know, that's a wonderful intention, isn't it? And I think that's a worthwhile intention. But I also know that when you say that, the one person on the face of the earth <laughs> who you would have a tendency to be not loving with, that's who's going to show up. And we say, why? Why does God send them? And it's, like, it's not that God sends them. It's because you've declared you want to be a loving vessel of God's light on the face of the earth. That means that whatever it is that obstructs that in you has to go. And the way it goes is it shows up so you can choose again. So I can choose again. So I can say, okay, now I can forgive. Now I can be nice and really, really mean it. Now I can let the past go. Sometimes, well, I think it's just, it just comes around a million times a day that we have to let go and forgive the past, all of us, forgive whatever it has been because nobody will ever be more. Nobody's life will ever get better. Nobody will ever get healed by holding on to what does not serve us anymore. And people sometimes say, well, I just can't let it go. Well, you have to. You know, that's like saying, I will not get off the Titanic until I fully understand why it's going down. <laughs> it doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? Read the report later when you're on dry land. Um, you know, because we do a spiritual practice on a daily basis, I think what that does for us is that allows us to have a more mature relationship with God and see how we are connected, how individually we are connected in to all of it. You know, that our hearts and our brains are, are working together. So it looks to me, at least from where I stand today, like the old world as we have known it for a very long time, a lot of that is breaking up. A lot of that is, is, is in the process of changing form. You know, so a new world is seeking to be born. So, I mean, I, as I look around, it looks to me, look to me, like pretty much everything is changing everywhere, isn't it? And so I have to trust that, okay, that I have some input into this, my consciousness, my thinking about it. I tell you, no good will come from saying the world is going to hell in a handbasket. No good. No good is going to come for that. And what I want you to think about, because this is, this is kind of what gets me back on the right track, is I think about children that are being born today. You know, so perhaps your children, your grandchildren, your nieces and nephews, the little kids in your neighborhood. And I think, what will it be for them 25, 30 years from now? You know, many, many of us you know, will still be here, but some of us, some of us will be gone. But I think that, that my consciousness, my thinking, my energy, what I put into the world right now is enormously, enormously important because there will be, <laughs> it will be contributing to the world that our children and grandchildren are going to inherit. And we don't want them looking back saying, boy, did those people really goof it all up for us. You know, why weren't they a little more conscious? Couldn't they have been a little more loving? Couldn't they have been blah, 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 whatever, whatever it is they might say. You know, God does not need us to suffer. You know, I really, really believe that that's true. 
but we experience suffering. I think, you know, uh, when we use our minds, when we use our energy in non-loving ways, you know, uh, because this essentially is when we're when we're non-loving, we have separated ourselves from God. What is God? God is the love and intelligence that creates the universe. That love and intelligence is everywhere. That means it's inside of us. So if I've separated myself from God, that's another way to say I've just separated myself from love. You know, when we're young, like, like say in your 20s, you know, you have a, there's an enormous amount of grace, isn't there, when you're in your 20s? You know, like you can work three jobs and never sleep for several days at a time. You can just live on pizza and donuts and not gain weight. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? I mean, it really is. It's just quite extraordinary what you're able to do because I think that the way... The universe is designed that when we're young and we don't know, we, um, we have all this wiggle room do you know, to experiment, to try, to learn, to stretch. But then as we get older, it seems to me that that type of grace um, diminishes because, uh, you know, if I don't sleep now, you know, really, when I was in college, I could not sleep for days at a time, and it never bothered me. I didn't even notice, you know. Have another cup of coffee and go on for another 12 hours, right? Now, if I miss my sleep, oh my gosh, it is, it is an epic event, you know. It's like the whole next day, I'm just not right. Oh my God, I didn't sleep, you know, that kind of a thing. But as we get older, I think there is really a different kind of grace that comes in. To, that, that starts to be revealed uh, in our life. Uh, and again, it's not that God wants us to suffer. Um, I, I was thinking that, you know, in the United States of America, people, people from all around the world think that it's easy in America, you know, because we are a very abundant uh, nature. And I would say, yes, materially, I think a lot of things are, are easier here um, than in many other places. Um, but but life is not easy here. Um, and why I can say that is because so many people struggle emotionally and spiritually. You know, that, that it's difficult because people think um, right now, in 2019, people think it's okay to be mean and mean-spirited. And I think that's not a good thing for our future. I think that's not a good thing for our children and our grandchildren to see, that mean-spiritedness. Because that's saying, this is OK. This is how to be in the world. And what we all understand is not good comes from that mean-spirited activity. You know, any situation will be what we desire and hold it to be in our minds first, right? Um, you know, pretty much everybody I know already feels like they've been through hell, don't you? I mean, do you, do you really need another special tour of hell? <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, we don't. And by the same token, I don't think we, as a species, need to have any kind of planetary Armageddon. I think we can get the things we need to get, self-correct, and move forward in a healthy, loving way. See, there is an alternative. You know, the, because the Earth out here, the planet, the collective consciousness of humanity shifts only when we shift. See, it's the easiest thing in the world for me to sit back in my chair and say, Oh, what is wrong with those people? They need to be different. Anybody ever said that? You know, or why are they behaving like that? Well, I'm involved. I'm a consciousness on the face of the earth too, right? And so the earth shifts when you and I shift. So by all we have been through, it's gotten us here. So I don't think anything is wasted for anybody. And I know everybody has been through amazing stuff. If we look back over our life and say, Oh my God, if when I was a kid I knew I'd go through all of these things that I have gone through, I don't know if I could have believed it. I, I mean, I really don't know that I could have believed it. But A Course in Miracles teaches us that we can learn through joy or we can learn through pain. And I would just ask you to think about what are you choosing right now? What's your method? I know, I know the pain gets our attention, doesn't it? That when we're in a joyful situation, we think, oh, this can't be that important because it's so good. Well, well I think there's something really wrong with our thinking there. You know, because it says again and again in A Course in Miracles that, that God wants happy learners. And I, I don't know about you, but I feel like I've learned through pain enough. You know, that wouldn't it be nice that if from here on out we did all our learning through joy? You know, I was, uh, I was looking at uh, a definition of the word inertia. And inertia, actually, I thought inertia 
um, meant to stand still, but it's not. It's actually inertia means to keep going in the same direction that we're already going. And you know, so, so what has to happen actually is if we just keep going in the direction we're going, in any part of our life, in any direction in our life, we need to have a counter force that's applied with consciousness um, willingly. You know, something that will move us in a different, greater, greater direction. You know, and so how I think that out pictures for us as students of the science of mind is we say, okay, I agree with what Ernest, Ernest Holmes said. There's a power for good in the universe and you can use it. But you know, as consciousness evolves, as we grow spiritually, Ernest also says there's a power for good in the universe and it can use you. You know? And I feel like that's really, really where we're headed. You know, again, in A Course in Miracles, it says that we have to ask every day, God, where would you have me go? What would you have me do? What would you have me say? And to who? In other words, this is about leading a surrendered life. And people don't like this idea of surrender because they think, oh, if I surrender, God's going to control me. God does not want to control you. If he wanted to control you, God would have made you a robot, okay? God is not interested in controlling us. I believe that God's intent is to fulfill us that the spirit of God within us seeks a fuller and greater expression of itself by means of us. In other words, God doesn't want to control us or hold us down or keep our joy from us. God wants us to be the biggest expression of life, of love, of goodness, of light that we could possibly be. In other words, God seeks only our fulfillment. Um, so calling in the future, I think we're doing that all the time. We're doing it right now by how we're being Please consider that this week. Let's pray. Thank you. So we take a moment to turn our attention inward now, remembering that right here, we stand in the midst of God's holy presence, God's spirit, God's light, God's love. That that spirit of God within us is the most true and real thing about each and every one of us. And so in this awareness of our connection with God, I speak this word. I speak the word for healing for each and every one of us that our hearts and minds are open, and today we let go of anything that does not serve, any incriminating belief for our, toward ourself or anyone else on the face of the earth. I speak the word that we dissolve any resentment, we let go of any guilt, we let go of any fear and doubt. And in this moment, we stand humbly before the very presence of the living spirit that is within us. And we know that its only goal, its only desire, is a greater expression of itself by means of us. So I claim for everyone greater fulfillment, greater healing, greater love. We include in our prayer today our family members and friends, our parents and children, everyone we hold near and dear, and we know God is right where they are, surrounding them, fulfilling, healing. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world in which we live knowing that it is our intention this day that there be healing, that love is the order of the day, that every person lives from a peaceful, compassionate place. We bless our church, we bless all churches, synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, all paths to God. And I know we're blessed by being together, that everyone gets to be healed, and we welcome it. And so with a full heart, I give thanks that this is so. I release this word, and so it is, together we all say, Amen.